Welcome to the Performance Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Calandrino. I've been advising business owners and investors for over a decade, and I've met some amazing people along the way. Uh, My goal is to share with you business and commercial real estate trends, as well as information about growth mindset. So if you're looking to grow, you're tuning into the right show. I have with me my friend Bill Umansky, and he said I have to throw my notes out the window. So I don't even have like your bio or anything because he wants me to wing it. I did make like just a couple notes for like fun, but uh, <laughs> you have a foundation. Uh, you have your law firm. Tell, just, why don't you tell people about you a little bit? Oh, you know, that question always kind of blows me off because I don't, I, I, it blows me up because I'm kind of like, what do I tell people without bragging or sounding like <laughs> uh, a bougie kind of guy? But uh, yeah, I run a practice, criminal and personal injury practice in Orlando for over 20 years wow. and um, probably now 25, 28 years since 1997, I think. I get the year wrong, yeah. I don't count. And uh, we have about 25 to 30 people, including virtual assistants that are full-time. And uh, we do uh, quite a bit of uh, personal injury work. And we also have about eight or nine uh, men and women who are amazing, amazing criminal trial lawyers. And I kind of have the leadership role in the firm, uh, so I don't practice law anymore. And my job is to kind of not manage the firm. I have people that do that, but my job is to motivate, lead, and uh, also rain make, bring in cases as well. And yep. And you have your own podcast too. Yeah, we have a a podcast called the Lawman's Lounge, uh, which you were on. And Mm -hmm. uh, it is, we have about 15,000, I think, subscribers or people that we send the, uh, I wouldn't say subscribers that we send out to, uh, it's mainly geared for lawyers and uh, talk about some of the same things that you do about systems, about uh, intake, about anything to do with business and helping business owners, especially law firm owners, navigate their business. It's kind of like a laid back cocktail setting, which is kind of why I asked you to throw out that script with me because <laughs> I wouldn't know how to follow a script. And then I also have a foundation called the uh, Second Chance uh, Foundation. We give out education uh, stipends to students who have over a 3.0 and write an essay on what called second chances. I'm married for 28, 29 years to a powerful lady who uh, I accuse of emasculating me, but the truth <laughs> is is that she has boundaries and uh, I need them, so I appreciate her very much. And two boys and two dogs. Yes. That's pretty much my life in a nutshell right now. I love your dogs, by the way. They go like everywhere. It was around the time you were about to be like an empty nester with your boys that you got the dogs, right? Because I I think your dogs actually came to the baby shower for my first baby. Yeah, it was a strategy (laughs) uh, because when my wife came to your baby shower, of course, she'd want grandchildren. And uh, when the kids left, we were thinking to ourselves, all that attention to the kids is now going to be turned on her husband. I didn't want that, so I <laughs> bought two little dogs, and uh, they became her, her, uh, her life, and she loves them. And now she's hoping that my twenty-four or twenty-five-year-old kid will have a kid soon, and that's a little too, sh- <laughs> too quick in time. But yes, Boots and Bella. The dogs will hopefully keep her busy for a little bit longer. Yeah, it's oh been my. seven, eight years. I don't know. She's getting to that stage, so. Man, man. Um, if I met you through the Orange County Bar Association. I think there's something like 35, 4,000 members, something like that. Uh, attorneys, you were doing like the social chair. And like, I remember we were also on leadership for that. And so like, I remember you had like your kids, like back when we were at like a retreat. That's how long ago it is. And you're talking about their 24, 25 now. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I remember always being impressed by you because uh, I think you were doing paralegal work or something yeah. back then. And uh, I just knew that you were going to be like, uh, like, it's funny because we have someone in common, Robin Kessler, mm-hmm. who's a commercial broker. And I'm at the stage, like if I ever had a sell or anything, I might say, hey, Robin, I I've always used you in the past, but I got to give Amy a shot <laughs> just because I respect her so much. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And you've built yourself quite a career and uh, was smart 
because you used uh, your background as a paralegal instead of looking at it where some people look at it and go, oh, I'm not a lawyer. You know, my current her husband's a lawyer. I'm not that. You never had any of that attitude. You're like, I'm paralegal. I'm proud of it. Uh, now I'm going to get into uh, managing an office. Oh, now I'm going to become a broker. And I'm going to use those connections in the legal background because lawyers need houses and lawyers need buildings and mainly lawyers need buildings. So you just kind of morph right into it. It was very impressive how you pivot and use what you accumulated and the connections that you had, which is really super smart. Well, we just I kept doing these business and real estate closings as a paralegal or just like intake for different matters. And I noticed the entrepreneurs that had the most wealth were the ones that owned their buildings. And we would constantly get tenant rep calls to represent the law firm, my husband's law firm. And they would want to get us into another lease, another lease. I call it like the lease ha hamster wheel. I, I, actually, I call it leasehold servitude is one of the words I use. Is You know, you get stuck in this lease thing. And they don't necessarily bring awareness to the fact that, why, why don't you own your commercial real estate? And so I started to notice that most of the entrepreneurs that came in, like had the most amount of wealth, owned their commercial real estate. I also saw like people like on the verge of filing for bankruptcy and emptying their retirement to pay for a lease and like working at the business to pay for their lease because they made the wrong decision. And I was like, well, that's pretty shitty. Like there's got to be like a better way, like someone who understands like business. And then, yeah, at that point, I'd gotten into more of the administration of the firm and I was involved. And yeah, I was very impressed. Like your team has always been involved with that. Like I, I met some your your firm administrator in the past and uh, there's called the Central Florida Chapter of Legal Administrators or something like that. And I got involved with that and realized too, that there's a whole business to running the law firm. So understanding a lot more of the management side, which I think then lended itself the detail orientedness of being a paralegal and then understanding the management and all of it kind of just came together uh, that I feel like I'm really more of like an advisor than a broker. Like, okay, what, what do you want? Where do you want to go? How do I help? How do I help get you there? So right. design yeah. the life you want, right? That's yep. why you have a business, right? Exactly. That's right. A hundred percent. So so I'm excited to be on your podcast. So uh, no script, uh, just whatever questions you have, we'll just try to answer them and hopefully provide value for your listeners. Well, one thing that impresses me always is your passion for like cooking and, but also you love to exercise. Do you exercise so that you could cook all these yummy meals or <laughs> that so they kind of yeah, lend to each other? Yeah. I don't, I don't believe in diets. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, I, in fact, I just had lunch with a very good friend of mine and I had a sandwich at a place called Pom Poms <gasps> been around. I love Pom Poms. Yeah. And I had four sides. So, and I mean, that's a lot to eat actually. And so, so what I do is I, 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 I believe in the concept typically of moderation, but, uh, I do exercise a lot, but as you get older, you know, it catches up to you. You can't keep working off the, the, uh, meal. And no matter how much exercise you do, you have less energy, uh, less, less, you know, it's just, it's harder to your joints and everything else. So I, but I, I do cook a lot. I don't believe in diets. I do believe in moderation. Yeah. And, uh, so one thing I could tell you quickly that I learned that I've been teaching some other people now is, you know, it used to be that when you drink, people are like, well, I sneak like, uh, a tonic or seltzer water and lime, or I'll just have vodka mm -hmm. and soda water. And I can't imagine, because I do cook and I do craft bartend, I can't imagine being stuck at any event where I would just want cheap wine or uh, vodka and uh, whatever. So I learned two, there's several things that I did to learn to control drinking and therefore keeping weight down, uh, which is, is good, is that I made a resolution. If I go to a... a um, uh, an outing that we all mm -hmm. go to a lot that we see each other at a law event, they usually, what do they do, Amy? They don't serve expensive wine, right? They serve cheap yep. wine. So why have it in the first place? Cause it's just going to give you a headache and then you're going to have two and three. And then you aggregate that over 30 meetings, 60 meetings, 80 meetings during the year. And you now gain 10 pounds. So I'll sit there and say to myself, you know what? I'll drink uh, a beer. And I'll have a, or I'll, or, or maybe I'll drink a vodka cranberry. But 
what I'll do is I won't finish it and I don't even like it. So I don't taste it. I'll just have a couple sips and I'll toss it. So then it came to time. Well, what happens when you're out with your friends and you're networking, you're going to the places that you like. Yeah. So that can get pretty hard. If you're out with a bunch of guys that like steak and you start with that old fashioned one or two, then get to the wine and then you get to an after dinner drink, you've had four or five, six drinks. No matter if you're Ubering home, you don't feel like good the next day. So what I've done that's relatively new now is I was at a steakhouse the other night and I've been doing this for about three months. And as a result, I lost about five pounds, mm -hmm. um, literally five wow. pounds. I ordered the old fashioned. I don't think about the guilt of not finishing it. I don't think about anything else about my friend saying, why are you not drinking it? Or the server comes over, you don't like it. I take two or three sips and I, they're slow sips as I'm doing it. I put it down move on to my next uh, thing, which let's say it's a salad, it's Caesar salad. I'll have a white wine, take a couple sips while I'm eating, put it away. There'll be four glasses <laughs> of liquor on the table and I've had less than one. And what I've done is, is that you get the taste of it. Now you got to get over the fact that you're paying for that, but there's a lot of things we pay for. People go gamble a hundred dollars a hand. What's the difference between paying $30 for alcohol you're getting the sip, you're getting the taste, just feeling the feel, the emotional memories that you may have. You're not feeling like you're sacrificing really. Yep. And by the end of the meal, you've had less than one drink and yet you've been able to kind of have that all built out uh, around you. So uh, you talk about like cooking and drinking. Those are one of the strategies that uh, I've now taught a lot of people. Hmm. Um Yep. Also, if I'm at a cocktail hour mm -hmm. and um, people are really getting drunk and I don't uh, want to, and you know, yeah, you can control yourself, but you know, Amy, a lot of people get drunk. It's harder to stay up with them. Excuse myself to the bathroom, pour out the drink, go back, <laughs> get a cranberry juice. No one knows. It's like vodka cranberry. I don't feel like I'm suffering or anything. And so there's just little tricks that I do that you know, is it inauthentic? I don't know. Is, is, if someone's counting how much I've had a drink, they're either an alcoholic or an ass. So, uh, <laughs> so but, very true. You know, yeah. And then with cooking, uh, we don't believe in, in diets and we don't believe in cutting back on butter and oil. What we do do is just have less. Mm -hmm. So if, if we make a salad, we make more of the salad and then we have the, the dish that's very fattening. And then, piece it out over the uh, week, two or three days, just eat it slowly. So just eat more of the healthy stuff, but still not lose the taste of the food. So I don't know if that's called a moderation diet or just, I don't know what the hell I call it, but it, it has helped tremendously. You know, I, I had, um, I think there was a book called like skinny bitch in the kitchen or something like that by like Bethany Frankel. I'm trying to remember what the name of the book was, but, um, uh, she talked about like, that's how she's always stayed kind of like thin and healthy is like, she'll just like have the bites. Like, you know, she cooked a lot and everything like that. And it's, it's really after you've had those like first two bites or the first two sips, it's just, you know, what, what is it? I, I have been leaving a lot more like on my plate and like, and if you eat slower too, your appetite will kind of catch up to you versus like, I try, I, and I can't really eat as much as I used to. Um, right. Yeah. But yeah, we split steaks now when we go out, we just split a steak. I'm going to uh Christner's tonight with a, a very good friend of mine. And, uh, I'm going to suggest to him, let's split a ribeye. Let's not, we don't need all the whole ribeye. And if, if he's hungry, we'll eat more salad, tomato with onion salad at Christner's. <laughs> That's healthy, right? Not yeah. as fattening. And we'll order two salads, but when it comes to the meat, the unhealthy part, we'll split it. And you know, it's just, it's, uh, it becomes a discipline, I think, after, and then I, I swear you don't miss a beat after. Mm -mm. And also, like, if you're putting food on your plate, uh, one of the things that I found in a way of, you know, I'm, I'm a 31 waist now, which is really good at 57. Wow. Um, that was my, I was a 30 in college, so I jumped up to 32, which is still good, but I'm a 31, 32. I bounced back between the two. And, and like I said, it, I couldn't go as hard with exercise. So it really has all been about food control, but who wants to sacrifice? Right. I mean, I don't want to, you know, so you just gotta, there's ways to do it to trick your brain into, uh, that you're, you're, you're full. One thing is if you're cooking at home, 
and you're hungry, first of all, you should be, everyone knows this, eat little bites during the day and you won't be hungry. But we all know we get busy with work, busy with kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're starving. Well, when you make that first plate, you just said something interesting. After the first two bites, the first two sips. So make your plate smaller. Yeah. You know, because the more you put on that plate, you have this thing, you're going to want to finish your plate. And, you know, and then at least you finish the smaller plate, Mm -hmm. you've got to make a decision to walk over to the stove to get more or you may let it go. Well, or yeah. like while you're cooking, like have a little bit of cheese, a little bit of grapes, drink a, yeah. like a seltzer water or something like that while you're cooking so that by the time your dinner's ready, you're not like dying. So, but I'm pretty good. We do about, the same. Go ahead. Oh yeah. We do the same with dessert. Yeah. We order dessert at a restaurant, two scoops out, done. Don't think about the money. No, no. I mean, yeah. And just put it away. Yeah. So just, Here's the plate, push it away, and that's it. And I don't, I, I know people, we, we, we're with people uh, who are on streaks and they're psycho. One guy's got 99 days without having a piece of meat. And he's very proud of that. And I look at him and he goes out to eat, and you could tell he's like angry that he's having a piece of fish. He's a meat eater. And I'm like, dude, because I got to keep up the streak. You know, how many other streaks do you have? He goes, Didn't you read that book, Streaks? Streaks are the way to be successful. Like, I walk three miles a day, even if it's three in the morning. I'm like, you sound like it's great, but that's intense. Like, honestly, you know? So I think sometimes being less than perfect is okay and just, you know, does that make sense? Oh, no, no. That's like what my book's going to be about. Like, I'm writing a book from perfect to real, embracing authenticity to achieve peak performance. I lost my joy. I lost my fun. Like you remember the kooky, crazy Amy, like running around like the poker tournament, like at the OCBA, like having fun, not giving a fuck what anybody else like thought of me and like just having a good old time. And then I think when like I wanted to grow my business and having babies, I felt like I had to be like a certain way. And I did end up losing a lot of weight, but my body does not like to stay really, really thin. I'm, I'm like the same size as my grandmother. My grandmother is like a solid, like size 10. She's strong and she walks like a lot of miles. I think she just turned 90. And um, I'm just going to stay where my body where it wants me to stay. Like it's staying in this zone. Now I'm going to continue to add muscle. I'm going to continue to take off like the extra fat from having the kids, but I think you got to like listen to your body too. Like, cause if I have to drink egg whites for dinner to maintain a size, that's a sign that maybe your body's not supposed to be that size and maybe just embrace the way you are. And I've just decided that I, my body's not meant to be super, super skinny. I'm very strong and I can kick your ass. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I got my biceps here. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. All right. But yeah, like, I feel the same way. That's why I don't do heavy weights anymore because yeah. It was causing me way more pain, um, you know, than was required. So I just decided, you know, my friends make fun of me, but I do Pilates and I do cables like Tom Brady's workout mm-hmm. with uh, bands and I don't use free weights really and I don't care. So I use them sometimes, but not a lot. I, I do. It's a mixture. I like mm-hmm. hot yoga. Um, I really like, um, I like jogging, not like walk jogging. Cause I, if I run, it's too much like pounding. Um, but mm. I do like doing that. I do some five K's here and there, but I don't try to do like the half marathons anymore. I don't try to diet and drink like three protein shakes with tons of egg whites and not eat real food. I mean, I, I eat eggs probably every morning for like breakfast with like half of a bagel and, uh, for lunch, I just had like Brussels sprouts, like some chopped up chicken thighs and a little bit of rice. Like, but I mixed it in like some chicken broth and it was really good. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it's all about that. I think, uh, I hope that uh, I heard a quote the other day, like these people that can't, like are doing these programs and it's going from program to program to program to program. Like, I just don't know how joyful that life is. And as soon as you get off of it, like, what real long-term life changes have you made? Like what's actually applicable to your daily existence? Like what, where, where are you going from there? Like versus trying to find something that works for you. That's repeatable every day and that you're happy. Well, yeah. So that's why a lot of people are taking medication um, and they're losing weight. Uh, but the problem with that is it seems that uh, it's very, very effective. Uh, but at some point, if you don't get off the medication, 
you're going to be so skinny and unhealthy. And then if you get off the medication, there's this rebound effect. And I, I, I've seen it uh, among people. And you always are like, that person is looking good. They look good. They look good. And then all of a sudden, they're like, they look gone. They went from good to gone. You know, mm-hmm. and like, gone. Like, you know, your body's not supposed to look that thin. And, you know, and then so they eventually get off the medicine. And then three months later, they're like back to where they were. And it's like, you know, just if now there's there's different conditions, thyroid conditions, medical conditions, a lot of stuff that people have weight gain and stress and stuff. But so that medicine could be effective for certain people. But it is like programs. There's a rebound effect. And, um, you know, I I just feel like I don't know, I, I, I just haven't given up meat. I haven't given up French fries. I haven't given up any of that stuff. I just cut it back. That's right. it. I have a dietitian. So you go oh, to Orlando dietitian.com or nutritional awareness. So I had gotten so skinny. I couldn't get pregnant. Like I wow. could not get pregnant. And then, so I went up seeing like the dietitian and she's just like, this is not like a way to eat and like live life. And I started like adding in more food in like more whole foods and, or what happened? No, no. I was too skinny, but then also I started to like gain some weight back because I didn't know how to live life without drinking protein shakes. And, you know, um, I didn't know like the in between. And so she kind of coached me through that. And I still work with her like every so often for a recheck, but she said, actually, you should be adding things, not taking things away. Like I noticed when you post pictures of your food, like on Facebook, like there's tons of vegetables, there's tons of really like powerful, like ingredients. I think what's sustainable is like, if you're adding to, and you're like enjoying, um, enjoying the process, enjoying the journey. So like I worked with her and like, I went back for to see her today, the, this year for like a tune up and I've lost like seven pounds and seeing her, I'm still drinking alcohol. I'm still like eating. I mean, I might be working yeah. out maybe a little bit more, but um, but feeling good. Yeah. This dietitian uh, is is she charge hourly or subscription based or what? What's what's her deal with? Uh, what's your deal with her? And does she do nutrition? Because she does like the whole. Uh, she her specialty, and she was actually on my podcast. Yeah. Is entrepreneurs that are really like busy and like show like audit. And uh, for me, I don't want to like record my food. So I actually did like a food. There's an app where you take pictures of your food. So she would just look at pictures of my food and kind of like give me like ideas, like add this, not that. Um, No, she charges like a flat rate per session. And it depends on how many sessions that you buy. And uh, it's all really easy. It's virtual. Um, she has multiple dietitians now too. Like she, um, she has like a team of like five total people. It's been really cool to oh. watch her grow. So yeah. So a dietitian for an entrepreneur who is an entrepreneur, that's kind of cool. Yeah. <sighs> Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's, yeah. she's great. And I have a, I have a running coach too. I do believe in coaches. I think like yeah, having big- a good coach is, is like key to like accountability and making progress. Yeah, we use a system called EOS. So we have an entrepreneurial oh, yeah. operating system and we have an EOS coach comes in four or five times a year for a full day. Mm. Uh, we pay a decent amount of money for that and uh, keeps us accountable. I have a chief fractional uh, officer now who does the the the, the detail stuff with the money uh, mm-hmm. since I hate it. But he'll be the, the bad guy with all the departments, making sure they're holding to their numbers and having accountability and um, uh, yeah, you got to have coaches and you got to have people that know more than you do or can pick up your weak spots to move ahead. So um, yeah, it's interesting having the fractional CFO when people get to that point. And that's usually around that like 25 person point that you're like, yeah, like where you really need to, and they say the toughest numbers of breaking through the business I find is like three getting beyond three people getting beyond 10 people and then getting beyond the 30 people as like the hardest thresholds they say. And so you're approaching that, that next one. <laughs> well, I should not going up anymore. Uh, I also think that at some point, you know, scalability is great, but um, I don't, you know, there, there's this common term that people always use a very good friend of mine who helped uh, was one of the authors on mm-hmm. our book called tiger tactics. Oh Yeah. 
uh, which we just released our second book, which is called Tiger Tactics CEO Edition. Um, she believes if you don't grow, you die. And I completely agree with that, but I have a different uh, interpretation of what grow, and grow means. Um, many people's interpretation is scale, make more money. Mine's, uh, mine is uh, not necessarily scale, but growing could also include your your uh, spiritual or psychological or um, your ability to grow as a human being. So it's it's growth. Grow and die does not always mean big, mm. bigger is better. Build, 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 build. And in fact, I think it can be dangerous because when you hear the word grow and die, then people then join these coaching programs and they scale themselves up and some of them are making more money, but they have, in theory, the coaching programs are teaching you to build on other people's backs, uh, which is good. And you're having more time for your family and friends. And But if you're an entrepreneur that cares, you typically will care about your people and there'll always be a people issue or a downturn in business where you'll be like, what do I need to do? And then, you know, unless you don't care at all, you're basically back to this environment of stress because you're worried about your people, if not for yourself. So um, I just think growing is important, whether you grow in size, grow in uh, income, or just grow in personal self-development and uh, or the ability to grow in your way of loving other people. So whatever that may be, uh, you definitely, if you don't grow, you, you definitely die. But I don't think it's as what all these coaches tell us. Hey, if you're not grow financially, you're, you die. You got to keep adding pieces, keep going, keep going, keep going. Well, if you want to keep going and you're able to keep going and it's not at a cost to your personal development or to your personal happiness or your stress level, then sure, keep going. But if it starts becoming a burden, um, then who's to say why you have to be always growing in the way that people say that you're growing. So there's just different ways to look at that. It's interesting. I have another coach, a business coach, and he has me keep track of different metrics. Like how many books are you reading? How many times a week are you working out? How <clears throat> I keep track of how often am I going to church? Like how often am I getting together for like dinners and coffees with my friends? Like there's so many other metrics other than just, um, how my business is doing. Like my revenue did go down from 2022 to 2023 because I went through a transition. I went from eight agents to two and a half agents. Yeah. And, um, yeah. but I did half the deals, but I only went down like a very small percentage. Like my revenue per deal was up like 33%. And like yeah. the average size was up like 45%. And so and I, the quality of my clientele was, was a lot like better. And so I'm just focusing on more like craft, like artisanal, like high touch, high value, more selective. And uh, if all works out though, I think 2024, I'll be back to where I was at 2022, if not even more so. So, yeah. All right. But you could argue that you still grew regardless <laughs> of the income shift. And even if you had lost 25% of your income, you had a better client experience. Oh yeah. You had better client deals and you probably had a better relationship with those clients. So, you know, there's just different ways to look at it, you know? So, um, when I'm working, it's almost less. as if, right. So I haven't said yep. this publicly yet, but uh, I only actually, uh, I take over with my kids at one o'clock now. 1 PM. Right. And not every so day. Guess, like there's some days I have to get like a nanny in the afternoon, but before right. in 2020, 2021 and 2022, <laughs> I was working like eight to six, like every day. And so I was only spending yeah. like a couple hours with my kids every day. And now right. um, I'm usually taking over with them like around now, um, depending on the day, most days. And I'm not working as many weekends. I'm not working as many nights. And so I'm able to do much more in a little bit of time because I'm much more like focused and resolute about my vision. So yeah, I do think it's like growth. So um, yeah. and some people might be kind of scared to work with a broker when they find out like, wait, she only has this amount of time. And I'm like, well, I can make time like after one, if like I need to, but generally I want to kind of like stick to that because my kids enjoy it and they are usually resting from one to three anyways. And then I go to the gym in the afternoon. I like going to the gym at three. It's not that busy. Go do my workout that takes like 60 to 90 minutes and then come home and make them dinner. So 
It's kind of boring. Yeah. It's yeah. like, a, it's very simple and boring kind of to think of, but it's so rewarding too. Like it's like having a routine like that we follow. So, yeah. 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 And it's, uh, and again, what was left, what, what you really mean to say is that, you know, last year income was a little down, but you had higher quality clients, higher per deal. And you also had quality time as a mother. So, oh, yeah. you know, so that's the thing, you know, those are not trade-offs. They're just uh, blessings that are actually accumulated in aggregate, no matter what's happening on the financial side. So just, there's always an opportunity. Uh, it's just whether we see it or not. And a lot of times in life, I think I've missed seeing the opportunities that are right in front of me mm -hmm. uh, because we're so focused on some of the negative stuff. We get stressed as opposed to seeing, well, what really is the opportunity here? It's almost like getting laid off from a job. You know, some people look at themselves and go, they got fired and they're like, maybe they deserved it. Sometimes they can't even take accountability for what they did in mm -hmm. part of that. They either weren't competent or they weren't up to the level of what they were supposed to do or, or, or maybe they were wrongfully fired. But for the most part, there usually is a reason why people are terminated, at least from the owner's standpoint, that has some validity to it. But the people who get fired, you know, they keep moving on and then go to another place, get fired because they're not realizing the opportunity uh, that was afforded to them by being terminated because they think about the lack of money and survival. And that is exactly what all of us would think when we get terminated. But along in that time that we have to figure out how to put the next uh, piece of bread and a piece of meat in front of our family, there was an opportunity for that person to say, a, let me learn about myself. What is it about myself that related to and caused this issue? Uh, B, is this the right kind of career that I'm in? Uh, perhaps it's not the career that I'm passionate about. And this opportunity of being laid off allows me the opportunity to look at something else or find something else or do something else. Or, oh, I got terminated. Uh, this is now an opportunity for me to spend some time over the next week thinking about what my life needs to look like because I haven't mm -hmm. had time to look at it. I've been miserable working for this schmuck or this guy or this woman who I hate or don't like or in a job I don't mm -hmm. like. But people never do that. They don't take accountability. They don't look at the opportunity that's afforded to them. They just look at the consequence of the negative thing that happened and they battle with it with their ego and their their, their feelings uh, and also their scared uh, fear of not being able to put bread on the table. Uh, those fears are normal, but you have to also have the opportunity to look at yourself and look beyond and look where you're going. So I'm using that as an example of just generally speaking, opportunities present themselves. So you may make less money, but you may be in a situation where you're a better mother or you just never know. It's just, can you see, can you be positive and look for the opportunity that's being presented to you? I think religious people say it's God's plan or whatever, but whatever it's God's plan or no God or whatever, it's, there's an opportunity. You got to mm -hmm. just find it and be positive about it. So. Oh yeah. It's, it's incredible. I think if you take the time when the, I think the universe talks to you sometimes and you have to like have the space to like, listen to like make that pivot and go across that path and then not have fear and not operate out of a victim mindset, but instead like out of a, like a confident mindset. But yeah, I had a client call me, uh, tell me last week, he's like, because he's starting to do some development work. So we're creating this ecosystem of, so the traditional development model is, is somebody with a whole bunch of money or a bunch of investors come in build this strip center, build this building, and then they lease it out to all these people. And then, you know, 10 years later, everybody's rents get jacked up. Some of the, some of the businesses stay, but then some of them, you know, can't make it work anymore. They lose their lease and it just continues on in like perpetuity. So like, what if potentially then you develop this project that has like retail and office and the small business owners can buy condos within that environment, like how much more powerful that would be for all of these small business owners to have a stake in this development and not have to have fear of losing their lease. And so that's what we're looking at doing. And I was talking to another local uh, small business owner, you know, cause he knew about the project that we were working on. And he's just like, wow, that's incredible. He's like, now that I own my building, cause I had sent him it went back when we were thought we were going to lease it. And he's like, I didn't have any interest in leasing anymore. Cause this is a business owner that just became an owner. 
Because once you're an owner of commercial real estate, you don't really ever want to go back. Like you can't imagine paying somebody else money. And so yeah. I really think that a lot more <clears throat> growth minded entrepreneurs are going to consider, you know, purchasing. And once they purchase, having potentially two of these types of developments where multiple business owners all own a piece of it in this really cool community, rather than leasing from the developer at these huge rates, I think it's, it's going to be like a sustainable model that can happen here in Central Florida and beyond. But like, if I wouldn't be in that position and much more focused, me and my client, we wouldn't be having these really conversations and figuring out like how to make this work and how to attract the right people to invest in it and all these different things to actually make it a go. Um, before I was more so like volume, 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 feed my machine. But now it's more like, okay, I want to focus on the right mindset clients uh, right. that I really feel like I could add value. Otherwise, like I, I'm just, I might not be a good fit for someone who's transactional. So. Right. That's a really, really good, that's a lot of self-awareness, which is great. You yeah. Know? And I think, yeah, you have to have that. That's one of the things that it's just, you know, I love how you say that if there's um finding the, the universe talks to you or God talks to you, but finding the space and the time to listen. And uh, it's almost the same as looking for the opportunity, but also listening, uh, listening to what's out there. And both of those things are similar. You have to you have to be open to all that. Uh, having not been open a long time, I understand what the difference is between mm-hmm. being open to receiving that and then being closed off to that. So it's almost like a frequency, yeah. though. I'm noticing, like with this podcast and, and just different things, like you start to feel like almost like these vibrations of similar people, and then you can connect with them. And then once you connect with those people, then you're growing like together. Yep. So it's so cool. All right. I'm going to close out with, uh, I, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier playing poker. Uh, do you think like being a good poker player has anything to do with being like a good business owner or do you find any of the strategy help you in like litigation or what do you think someone, a good poker player is that translatable? Yeah, well, before I answer that, are you coming to the February 17th thing? Are you going to buy a ticket? <gasps> oh, wait, what? Wait, I keep missing it Feb- year after year. So you're having it February 17th? Yeah, look at your calendar real quick. Okay. Because I will tell you, a lot of people are out of town for a three-day weekend. You have kids, you may stay in town, but I would love it if you or Phil or both of you would come play. And I oh, need yeah, the players. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that the rotary one on the other yes, side? Yes, but, yeah, okay. it, but it's not cold pizza. It's an event. It's nice. It's top shelf liquor. It's going to be ribeyes, steak, salmon. It'll be fun. Cigars, yeah. massages. Yeah. Are you going to come? Yeah, I'll make it. It's are you going to buy a ticket? Yeah. I'll yes. It. Can okay. you can you buy a ticket? I'm going to send you the link. I need you to buy a ticket because I'm getting nervous. <laughs> we have a hundred players. Actually, you know, I it's got, interesting. Some of I, the some of my really good friends, I found out, um, Mike Brunstein, I met at your poker tournament. And I hadn't realized it. And uh, I've made I've made some friends through going to that. No, you should yeah. be able to fill up that room. How about you I put usually, it on Facebook? I, fill up, I do. I fill it up every year. But this year, a lot of the people that normally come, like Tarani, Tracy Stein, a lot of those guys are out of town. And I got to get newer players that are faces that are not there. So I'm asking people now to, to just reach out to their community and share it. So I'll share the link with you. But it... If if you purchase the ticket, I leverage that to say that, oh, we have 21 seats, 22 seats, 25 seats. So we still got uh, 20, what? It's the, we still got almost three and a half weeks, but I want to start selling them early. So if you could commit early, that'd be great. Now, to answer your question, your husband's a better poker player than I am. Um, and a, I would say to you, though, that I think in general, um, and I haven't litigated in a long time, so I don't want to answer that question. But I do think poker is definitely a game of life because when you're given a strong opportunity, a strong hand, two aces, you have a better chance of making more money on that hand or making a better opportunity out of that hand. And so when you're given a better opportunity, uh, you'd be silly not to seize it. So uh, you could slow play your aces, uh, but for the most part, you should play them pretty strong and hope, hopefully get some action and build up that pot of money because that is your pot to win. 
So you might want to be in a position where you're really putting it all, not all in necessarily, but a lot of it in because, you know, you may lose, but the odds are you got the strongest hand and you go with it. And I think that if you're given opportunities like that, you need to go out and seize those opportunities immediately. Uh, if they're lukewarm, like, you know, a king nine, it's an okay opportunity, especially if it's suited with two aces, I mean, two spades, but it's not the greatest opportunity, but it's a good opportunity. So you also need to know in business when to walk away, when to walk away from a decision that's not going to help your firm or a project that's not uh, moving on for you. So, yeah, you know, I love poker, even though I'm not very good at it, because it really, 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 really reminds me about life. And there's just so mm -hmm. many other lessons poker can be translatable you know, one, like we said, is starting with a great opportunity, a great set of hands, put your money in. You know, two is, you know, if it's not going well, you know, fold them. Another one is sometimes an opportunity like, you know, two aces looks great and you got your money in, but all of a sudden, you know, three cards, uh, not three cards, uh, a low end comes out and there looks like there's a straight or a flush on the board and, uh, you know, you, you want to, it's not just when you want to fold them, it's like you're in the opportunity, it's great, but sometimes those opportunities can change, and not just about folding your cards, but you got to recognize that your opportunity, which once was great, may not be, so it could be a partner that you invested in a business with, it could be a development that you get into with, with people that you had a high hopes for, and now, you know, the deal seems to be a good deal, but something's nagging at you because, you just think it's it's not the same deal anymore. Something's changed, you know. But can can you can you can you get out of it? Can you find another way to to navigate it? So poker is just and it's about money management, right? So how do you manage your money? Where do you take your shots? Where do you invest your money? Um, you know, and uh, as I think about it, it's probably why I'm not good at poker because <laughs> I am good at I am good at living a lifestyle, but I'm not data driven. And um, that's why I hired a CFO. But yeah, it's a lot like life. And, and of course, the easy one is, when do you bluff someone? You know, and in the world of authenticity, do you ever bluff them? Well, I remember signing up with my first software company, and they are now a company that's huge. I think they got $300 million of funding recently. And when I first met them, I went out to Las Vegas, when the owner of the company, who's no longer doing sales or anything involved except for vision, and I went out to his office and he filled his office with fake employees. That was a bluff because he knew I was coming to his office. It was an old strip mall and he wanted he wanted me to know it was really busy when really he only had three employees. He hired seven other people and and I went for it. I didn't sign up for it right away, but I was like, wow, things are really hopping here. He was a stone cold bluff and he's he proud of it. He's talking about that later. Because you guys became yeah, friends or something like that? Wow. Oh, yeah. And he's even said it on our podcast. He doesn't give a shit anymore. And so what was funny is, <laughs> uh, yeah, so when do you bluff? You know, and uh, sometimes bluffing is uh, one of those things in business where, you know, if, if, if you bluff and you get caught with your pants down, it doesn't go very well. So a well-placed bluff, if you're ever going to use that in business, has to be strategic mindful, well thought out, and very, very intentional. And you know, in your business of negotiating, uh, negotiation, uh, bluffs can come up occasionally. So, uh, you know, an easy one in not your context, but an easy one in context would be, you know, the, the doctor that's, uh, you know, she's selling her home because her husband and her are going through a divorce. The paperwork hasn't been filed yet. The realtor's sniffing out why they seem to be so desperate to sell. Uh, but Mimi is so resistant. You know, there's something coming, but they haven't filed the paperwork. There is a divorce. It's coming. She caught him with his pants down. She's waiting to kick him out of the house, or she's already kicked him out of the house. Yep. You're walking. You're the realtor's walking in, noticing that the, there's only one toothbrush in the master bathroom. <laughs> you know, but you're like the realtor representing them, and you gotta make the bluff. Oh, everything's good. Let me put that second toothbrush out. Yeah, like let's, <laughs> <And bake, laughs> let's not make it so bake obvious. Bake some cookies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but there's bluffs. So uh, just in the commercial, I, in the, that was a residential issue. But yeah, so yeah, <laughs> my one bluff. Poker definitely uh, helps. I remember my bluffing. Um, my I had done a bunch of tenant rep 
files, but my first listing to list an office condo, they wanted to ask me about like my prior sales. <laughs> and somehow I just completely avoided that question. And uh, <laughs> I like had to like completely skirt around it and I ended up getting the exclusive done. And I did a, I did a damn good job. I, I sold it for like a record price there. And then that gave me right. the momentum to then do the next one and do the next one. But I had to completely bluff and avoid the question because I didn't want to say <laughs> I've never listed a property for sale before. <laughs> so my poker came out there, but oh man, this was fun. So that yeah, I'll see you February 17th if I don't see you before then. So maybe that's the All way right, great. I have to see you. And then we don't yep. have to worry about setting up a dinner. All but, right, great. Uh, I'll see you then. Oh, and then and wait, if yes. people want to get a hold yes. of you or follow your podcast, all the things, give all your information. Uh, yeah, a lot of people DM me on Instagram. Bill is the lawman. Uh, also, uh, my podcast is the Lawman's Lounge. It's on Apple and Spotify, and I think several other places. And uh, uh, my uh, cell phone is four zero seven three nine nine seven nine nine nine. But most people just reach out to me either on Instagram or Facebook, typically. So cool. Alrighty, yep. well. Nice. It nice get on your show. Nice yes. seeing you. All right. I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks for everybody for tuning to in. You. Oh, you're Bye. not going to beat see me. You. No way. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Bye. Yeah, well. Bye. Bye. Bye.